Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Fabrizio Mancini. Fab. Open Gangnam Style. Come on, everybody, get up. Gangnam Style. Hey, guys, wanted me to do the Gangnam Style, so join me. Come on. Come on. Who knows how to do it? Come on. 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 You know, it's funny because uh, the guys were saying to me, you know, I said, are you using a song before you introduce me? And they said, yeah, we're going to use the one you did in Vegas when you did the gunman style, you know. <laughs> and I, I like that song because it's just very uplifting, right? It makes us feel like we can have fun. You know, that guy <laughs> broke every record when it came to a video, YouTube, shown on uh, YouTube. And so many people saw it. But when you looked at the video, you can tell that he was having fun. Would you agree? And I think that, unfortunately, we have forgotten how to have fun sometimes. It seems like in life, we go through and we have all these expectations, expectations of ourselves, expectations of others, and we kind of lose ourselves in the process of understanding that what was it that we were trying to accomplish in the first place? The principle that I was asked to speak about today is the principle that Dr. Parker taught us for so many years, and it's the be, do, have formula or principle. Have you heard that before? And this one, when I first heard it at a Parker seminar as a student, I was recognizing the fact that he was trying to teach us how to decondition ourselves from failure. Because unfortunately, when Dr. Parker came into the scene in the 1950s and began the Parker seminars, the reason he was able to be so successful in his 18 clinics is because he realized that this principle is the foundation for all success. But unfortunately, as society, as human beings, we have been conditioned to think that we must have something, right? We must have something before we can do something so then I can be someone. I can be someone. And most of us in our conversations are constantly talking about the having, right? Am I the only one here? It's the having. So may I ask you a question? How many of you would like to have more money? Raise your hand. All of us, right? How many of you would like to have more happiness? How many of you would like to have a better relationship with your partner? Come on, guys, raise your hand. I know you want to. Come on, don't be shy. How many of you would like to have nicer shoes? Come on, ladies. You're not kidding anyone. I've been to Nordstrom's. I'm telling you, that shoe store in Nordstrom's, whew. The busiest place. How many of you would like to have a bigger screen TV? Come on, my fellows. Or a nicer car. See, all these having things, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, in life, you learn that life was meant to be a life of abundance. There is so much abundance in the universe. The challenge is that our minds are very limited. And if we can just be able to tap into what we in chiropractic call our universal intelligence. When I heard that principle of universal intelligence from my chiropractor in my first visit, I realized that I was dealing with a healthcare provider that was tapping into a greater intelligence than the one that just my body had. See, we call that in healthcare giving hope to your patient. See, in the early years, our pioneers were the last resort for many of the conditions that were killing human beings, or perhaps creating tremendous amount of suffering. So their conviction to be a chiropractor and a chiropractic assistant in those days was so high because there was no other choice. 
So even though every so often somebody will be knocking on the door and taking them to jail because they were practicing medicine without a license, allegedly, they will still go to jail, adjust all the inmates, right? The judge will come in in between sessions and get adjusted too. But what was beautiful is that the patients will stand outside of the courtroom with their picket signs, release our chiropractor. And then they will interview them and they will testify that they were not, that, that the doctor never said they were practicing medicine. They were practicing chiropractic. And that's why BJ was writing so many books about the distinction between medicine and chiropractic. The challenge is that there's only one thing, it's called healthcare, and it's a mess. It's a mess because it's set up in a paradigm that is no longer working. It has bankrupt not only most of the countries out there, but it's bankrupting all of us individually. Harvard University released a study two years ago that said that over 65% of Americans went personally bankrupt because of a healthcare issue. Over 65%. Can you imagine that? One thing, health, is allowing so many people to go personally bankrupt. It's interesting that the study also cited that the majority of those people had health insurance. So health insurance is not gonna be the answer to you be able to live your life to your full potential. But the challenge is that as we're growing older, right, as we begin our journey of life, we begin to put things as our priorities in life. And many people have sacrificed many things from relationships, right? You get very upset at your parents when they don't want to buy you something that you want. Am I the only one with children in the room? But I want this. Or perhaps, you know, you're in a relationship and the other person has an expectation that you will do something or buy something for them, but you don't do it. And they resent you for not doing it. The having, unfortunately, has kept us from the most important thing that Dr. Parker was teaching us for so many years, is that in order to have things in life, you must be that that you want to have. You must be that that you want to have. So a simple exercise is this. Let's say that I want to have more fitness. This happened to me personally. I wanted to be more fit. This happened probably, I think it was maybe 18, 20 years ago. I was at a Parker seminar, I think in Toronto, if I remember correctly, and the speaker was saying, is there anything in your life that you would like to have more of or that you'd like to be better at? And the only thing I could think of it at that time was I wanted to work out every single day, but I was not doing so. And then the exercise was very simple. Now that I know that fitness is what I wanted, then he shared the formula that Dr. Jim had taught us. He said, well, what are you going to do to ensure that that's going to happen? And then he said, but the doing is not really where the magic is. Who are you going to be once you achieve it? Does that start making sense? Who are you going to be once you achieve it? I'll give you a story of one of our students that we had at Parker when I was president. And this young man was very excited about becoming a chiropractor, very excited. He was referred by someone that had attended Parker before. And at orientation, he stood out because he was the only one wearing a suit and a tie. A very young man, probably about, probably maybe 24 years old, something like that. And I never forget that after the session, he came and gave me a hug and I asked him, I said, do you mind if I ask you why you're wearing a suit? He said, well, my chiropractor told me that if I wanted to be successful in life, I needed to dress for success because it's what makes me feel successful. He was being successful even though he was just a student at the time. A borrowing money like most of us in school, probably not having a very nice car or an apartment, not having any money in the bank, but he was being what he was planning to be in the future. Well, that same young man wore a suit and a tie almost every day of school for three years. 
And when he finished school, I never forget, I kept following up with him. He became one of the most successful alumni that we had because he had conditioned himself to follow the mentor, his chiropractor, that always wore a suit to go to work. He wanted to already in his mind understand that just by doing that one thing, he was being the person that he wanted to become. Another person, uh, to give you another illustration, another alumna that we had was an individual that uh, she was an athlete in college. And when she finished Parker, she said, I want to be the most uh, successful chiropractor in sports in my city. And what she did is during school, the last year of school, she went to the most successful chiropractor in sports in our city and volunteered any time she had free from school into their office. She went in there and she says, I have so much time free this week and next week and next week. Use me in any capacity that you want. So they will have her pick up the phone. They will have her do some billing. They will have her do anything that the office needed. But she kept watching, watching how that chiropractor behaved. From the moment the patient walked in, she started modeling the same behavior. By the time she graduated, she came into my office, and I'll never forget this. She said, I'm a little bit depressed. And I said, what happened? He said, well, in our hometown, we had 167,000 people, and there were 42 chiropractors at the time. She says, I went to 10 chiropractors, and they all told me that I will never be successful in this city, that there's too many chiropractors. Have you heard that before? And I reminded her the same thing that Dr. Parker would have told me, and that is that success has never been based on anything other than yourself. And that if she believed that this is the city where she wanted to practice, then that's the city where she needed to be. So I encouraged her to do it, even though everyone else had done, I didn't do it. She borrowed some money from her grandmother, and she started a very humble practice. But it was the kind of practice that she had envisioned all this time, ever since she started school, the one that she had modeled the chiropractor by doing everything that that chiropractor did in their office, she was following the same behavior. Within one year, she surpassed everyone in that town as far as success, within one year. The ones that told her she wouldn't be successful, now she was the most successful. And you know why being is so important? It's because when you're being what it is that you want to, to, to become in life, that sets what is called the law of attraction into motion. And the law of attraction says that you are, right, whoever you're being, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're doing is what you attract into your life. In fact, many people say what you think about, you bring about. She was thinking of herself as a successful sports chiropractor all this time. And guess who was one of her first patients when she first started that little humble office? It was the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. He happened to live in that area. And he told every other cowboy that this is the lady you want to come see. Even though at that time they didn't have a chiropractor in the team, she became the unofficial chiropractor for them. And then the hockey team began to see her. And then the golfers began to see her. Then the basketball players began to see her. You go into her office, and it's like a who's who of sports in the city of Dallas. It's been like that since she started, all because she was being. I had a very special moment with Dr. Parker. And the reason that I'm talking so much about him is because this principle is one that resonates with him more than anyone else I've met in my life. When I was a student at Parker, I was traveling with Dr. Parker because I was speaking at Parker seminars as a student. And Dr. Jim got up at noon, and then he went to bed at 4 a.m. Because he said that he got more work done in the evening when everybody else was sleeping. That was his schedule. So at the seminars, he would stay up a little bit late and invite some people to come and hang out with him, sit around. I had a student that told me recently, she said, you know how I met Dr. Parker? He said, I was a student from Life University attending Parker's seminar. Dr. Jim found out that we were students from Life University and said, 
hey, listen, tonight if you want to come to my suite, this is the number. We're going to just be talking philosophy. That's the kind of person he was. He would invite the speakers to come and join him. Because he wanted to celebrate the one thing he loved the most in his life, and that was chiropractic. The one thing that cost him almost four marriages, right? I say almost because the fourth one was common law. Because he dedicated so much of his life to chiropractic. The one that cost his health to not go be so well because he was never taking care of himself as much because he always put chiropractic first. So one evening, we're in a seminar, and I happened to be there when everybody had left, and we start talking about his vision, what he envisioned for chiropractic in the future. And I want you to know something that really struck me because I was just a very naive young student. As he was sharing his vision, I started getting tears in my eyes because I knew he wasn't going to accomplish all of that in his lifetime. So I happened to say something to him that I've never shared with anyone else in my life. I've never said that to anyone else in my life. I said, Dr. Jim, I wish I could give you the remaining of my years so you can actually accomplish everything you want to accomplish. And he said to me, Fab, you don't have to do that. Because you're going to be who you are meant to be in this profession and in this life. And I'm going to write my life as long as I can. You see, the one lesson that he taught me there is that you can never be anyone else. But what do we do, most of us? We compare ourselves to other people. Would you agree with me? I don't know if you remember the story that Dr. John Martini told us many years ago. He says it once in a while that he was hired as a consultant to go to Australia to consult with this chiropractor that wanted to be more successful. So when Dr. John Martini walked into his office, he noticed that this one chiropractor kept referring to the other person that was down the street because he kept comparing why he wanted to be just like them. He wanted to be just as successful as them. And that was his idea of success, a comparison. We do it all the time. Am I the only one or no? We do it all the time. We compare ourselves to other people when, in fact, none of us were meant to be the same. You know, I love the diversity of our profession because this, I think, is our greater strength. What I don't love is the fact that we do not support one another to the degree that we could. What I do not love is that we judge and criticize one another when we should be loving and nurturing one another. So then, Dr. Dr. DiMartini said, look, you're paying me a lot of money to be here for one day. In order for me to understand what you're talking about, let's go talk to that person and see if he'll spend lunch with us. So of course, they called him up. He knew Dr. DiMartini, so he said yes to lunch. And during the lunch, he started asking him a series of questions. He said, would you tell me how you spend your day? Would you tell me about the relationships you have with your partners? Would you tell me about the relationships you have with your community? Would you tell me about the relationships you have with your synagogue, church, temple? Would you just share with me what is your value system? And that's how he termed it. So then he went back to the office with the remaining of the afternoon. And he says, you know what? you've made it very easy for me to help you become as successful as he is. He said, what do you mean, Dr. DiMartini? He said, well, as I've gotten to know you this morning, you've said to me that you really appreciate your home life and you appreciate your family. And the reason that you close at 6 o'clock p.m. every night is because you want to be home for dinner and you want to be able to help your children with their homework and you want to spend some time with your family. Is that right? That's right, Dr. DiMartini. He said, well, the gentleman that you told me to go see, the one you're comparing yourself to, actually has had two divorces, doesn't have a family life, and the children that he has hate him because he doesn't understand them, doesn't appreciate them. So all you have to do is just work as hard as he does because he's working until 8 o'clock at night. He's working Saturday, sometimes even Sunday. So if you can just increase... Your, your, your time frame, you're going to be just as successful as he is. He said, well, I'm not willing to do that. That's not important to me. 
And he went on in every area of the life. He was very much a, an individual that supported his church. The other one didn't go to church. He was an individual that was a leader in his community. The other one never had a leadership position in the community. It was all about making money. I'm sharing that story with you because when it comes to being, you need to find your own authenticity is what I call it. What is it that makes you be unique from anyone else? And once you start appreciating that, once you start embracing that, you know, I, I went through a very interesting opportunity because when I decided to become a chiropractor, right, I interviewed, I think it was 62 chiropractors. It was over 60 chiropractors in a period of six months. Why did I do that? It's because I learned a simple thing that many times we think that something is very different from the outside in when inside out, you know, when we go inside of that life, it's a very different thing that we never imagined. Would you agree with me? Most of you think that billionaires have it easy. Just go and meet some of the billionaires in life, and you'll find out that they don't have it easy. In fact, there's some of the most challenging lives that you will ever see. Some of you think that if you just have a, a hot wife and a hot husband, that everything is going to be dandy in your relationship, right? And you know that that doesn't happen, but that's the way we think when we're in our 20s. We're looking for things that are different. You know, my father asked us to not get married until 30 because he knew that in, he got married at 18. And he said, I couldn't be the husband I wanted to be. I couldn't be the father I wanted to be. I didn't have the maturity. What I'm here to tell you is you need to identify what is it that you want to be first and foremost. If it's in chiropractic, who out there do you emulate? When I saw those 62 chiropractors, I fell in love with chiropractic because I saw myself as a chiropractor. From that moment on, when I went through school, I began to model some of the behaviors I saw those chiropractors do. I give you one behavior. I started printing my cards from day one. The only kid in my class, people were making fun of me because I had a card as a student. And I put their student of chiropractic, but I put my phone number there. Uh, and I it started introducing myself to people and giving them my card. Later on, I was to learn that Dr. Parker was teaching the fact that we should always have a card with us. Do you know that most of you don't have a card with you right now? If he was here, you will never hear the end of it. <laughs> do, you hear, do you know that most of you don't put your emails in your, in your cards? And you know that the emails is a way that people communicate nowadays, right? They don't call the phones anymore. They email. Put the email of the office if you don't want to put your personal email. But at least have an email. So when I started really understanding that process of what I've learned, I began to recognize that I was already programming myself to become successful like the ones that I had interviewed. Out of those 62 individuals, I knew there were people there that I saw myself as. I saw myself as them. I started acting like that. One of them was the one that never went anywhere without giving cards. When I spent my day with him, he took me to lunch. It didn't matter where he went to put gas. It didn't matter where he went to lunch. He was always giving his card and telling people, I love to be your chiropractor. I love to support you in any way that I can. We have to understand that the having is really a byproduct of the being. That's really all I'm saying. Most of us, Dr. Jim taught it to us in a different way. He said, most of you are wanting money, right? All of us raised their, money, their hand. And he would say, do you realize that money is a byproduct of your service? Your service is the doing. But in order for you to do the doing in a way that is actually going to take you to the high potential, you have to actually be what it is that you're doing. You know, I often use the, the words that says, the easiest way to communicate something is to live it. Dr. Parker used to say, you can't communicate something successfully until you own it. So my question to you is, who are you being? I can tell you right now that most of us are not being authentic. Most of us put a mask every time we get up in the morning, even to the person next to us. We pretend that everything is fine. We get people that ask us and say, hey, man, how's it going, Fab? Oh, everything is great. 
Now, granted, if everything is fine, it's great, but understand that all of us are going through some challenges, challenges that are meant to be part of our lives. I often tell the story of the little boy that was playing in the backyard and got so excited because he found a cocoon. And he runs inside the house and says, Mommy, Mommy, look what I found. The mom goes from the kitchen into the uh, patio and says, Show me, Johnny. And Johnny said, Look, Mommy, it's a cocoon. He said, Well, honey, do you realize there's a beautiful caterpillar there trying to, to, to move forward, trying to become this butterfly? This beautiful butterfly. So the little boy, without her realizing, runs inside the house, gets a pair of scissors, comes outside, and starts cutting the cocoon so the butterfly can come out. But unfortunately, the butterfly can't fly. And she said, oh, Johnny, I wish you wouldn't have done that. Don't you realize that that cocoon is what gives that caterpillar, that gives that entity the opportunity to struggle, to fight through it, to break through it, in order to become that beautiful butterfly that we were all meant to be. I want you to know that if all of us start praying or wishing for suffering, none of us will be disappointed. Would you agree? <laughs> Where did we ever get the idea that it was meant to be easy to be a chiropractor? If you study your history, you find out that chiropractic has never been easy, but that's because we are the butterfly of healthcare. We are the butterfly of taking care of people. And the challenge is that that's never going to happen automatically because we have to go through all these struggles in order to identify and find out what Diddy Palmer thought in 1895. A profession that was 200 years ahead of its time, but everything is moving towards the realization of exactly what he said. I'll tell you what happened to me recently. I was speaking in San Diego. So the last year, uh, first year after I retired, I only started speaking at Parker Seminar. Why? Because of my love and support to Parker. I want you to know that this institution, this, this entity, you're not just being part of an event here. You're being part of a history, a history that actually has built some of the biggest practices in the world. But you know how they build those practices? Because Dr. Parker taught us that a practice is an extension of the person. So all this weekend, you have been trained, you have been guided, you have been shared with information that is allowing you to understand that you are the most important person in driving this forward. Whether you're a DC or a CA or a spouse, that if you work on you, the practice will be fine. That if you work on you, chiropractic will be fine. But unfortunately, we don't think like that. Unfortunately, we don't think like that. I think of those pioneers, you know, that went through so many struggles that today we can't even fathom. How many of us right now, and I'm being honest, you don't have to raise your hand for this one, but how many of us right now will have enough conviction to actually show up Monday morning knowing that it's illegal to practice chiropractic within the state that you're in? How would you answer that question? Would you still get up understanding that people and humanity are suffering more today than ever, right? A statistic that came out a couple of years ago, which is so alarming, so alarming. It was the fact that this is the first generation that is not supposed to outlive their parents. I saw my parents bury my older brother. I can tell you as a parent, how many of you are parents? Can you imagine the idea of not outliving your own son or daughter? It's inconceivable. But that's what the statistical people are predicting of this generation because of the healthcare problems that they're undergoing right now. And we can do something about it. We have the answers. So then I started going and speaking other places. I started speaking at corporate America. I started speaking at medical conventions, osteopathic conventions, acupuncture conventions, and you know what I realized? Is that all of those healthcare providers are going through the same struggles as we are. The only difference is that they don't have in their premise what we have, and that's that universal intelligence, that innate intelligence inside of us that is connected. Do you realize that this profession's philosophy 
is so ahead of his time. The reason I get so excited about being a chiropractor is because I know a hundred years from now, we may not have a specialty in medicine. We may not have maybe even medicine the way as we know it today. But I know with every cell in my body that we will have chiropractors around the world helping sick people get well. I know that. I felt that. I get reminded of that every year because we have a premise that is so vast, so advanced. So when I was speaking at a medical conference recently, I met a scientist. And this scientist was taken by my message because everywhere I go, I talk about me being a chiropractor, why I chose being a chiropractor, why I believe chiropractic is so important in everyone's life. So the individual is a researcher, right? Been nominated twice for the Nobel Prize. He hasn't won, but he's been nominated twice. All his friends are the Nobel Prize winners. And he says to me something. He says, I've never been to a chiropractor. Actually, I never really understood chiropractic like I do today after listening to you. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I have been very successful, as you know. He's one of the top researchers. I mean, from Clinton to the Bushes, he's been in every academy, anything that you can give him as an award, he's had it for the most part in the medical world. He says, my research friends are envious of me because of the success I had. But I have a secret, and I want to share it with you, that secret. And I said, what is it? He says, in my research, one thing that I never do is establish a research that goes against nature. I always do what nature tendency is going to be, and I try to find a way to support work with, align myself with, with what nature's tendencies are. He says, after listening to you today, I realized that that's what chiropractic is. That chiropractic is a healthcare profession that is aligned with nature in a way to remove interference so the body can actually function the way it was designed to function. It's that simple. We are not trying to do something to the body that the body's not wanting to do because we're only aligning ourselves with nature, aligning the spine and the body so it can be aligned with universal, so then the body can actually have the potential of healing that is already inborn. Does that make sense? So then he did something that surprised me. Six weeks later, he tells me that he's bought every book written in chiropractic and read it. He asked me if I could introduce him to the top researchers in the country, and I did. And then I invited him to do a talk at a group that I was speaking to. And I said, would you do me a favor? Would you come and speak to this group? I'd love for you to share your own impressions. But he didn't tell me what the subject was going to be. And you know what he did? He took the 33 principles. And he aligned all the 33 principles with noble discoveries. i give you an example. He says, you know, you guys talk about subluxation? He said, well, that's a term that we don't understand. But did you know that there was a Nobel Prize winner that describes the subluxation as Didi described it? That is called cell signaling. And it's identical to what B, uh, Didi said. And he went on and on with all these Nobel Prize winners, and he started organizing this concept to the point that he thinks that he may want to write a book about it. Because he says if today Didi Palmer was alive, he will be the most revered scientist in the world, even though he didn't come from that background. You see, universal intelligence comes from above down, right? We've been taught that. But the being that I'm talking about here is when you get a thought that no one else gets, and all of a sudden you start sharing that thought with somebody else, and eight out of 10 people on average will tell you that's not possible. Am I the only one there? Or can you relate with me? That that's not that possible. That you will never be able to accomplish that. That that's never been done before. I still remember being around Dr. Jim so many times where people would tell him, Dr. Jim, this will never work. Dr. Jim and board members and also uh, people consultants and people out there, leaders of the profession, this will never work. And nine out of ten times he was probably, I mean, he made it work. See, my older brother, one of the lessons that he taught me, he says, when you get a thought in your mind 
is because you are meant to be the one to deliver on that thought. So whatever thoughts you have, even though it may seem weird, it may, so it may seem a little bit out there, understand it's only because you are meant to be the one to do it. See, I didn't realize that when I graduated, I went and worked as an uh, associate doctor for four months. Within those four months, he offered me a partnership. I turned it down. He was the most successful chiropractor in Miami at the time. There were two. They were th seeing 3,500 patients a week, each one of them. So I went with one because it was more aligned with my values. Dr. Jim calls me on the phone and says, hey, this couple out of Belgium, they want to bring you to Belgium and run the largest chiropractic in Belgium, uh, in, in Europe at the time. And I said, okay. I said, are you sure they don't have something in the south of France or Italy or somewhere more fun where the beach are? No, it's in Belgium. Okay, I'll go to Belgium. So they offered me $10,000 a month cash, working three days a week, six hour days for one year. Beautiful experience. So I come back and I stop in New York, then I go to Dallas, then I go to Miami where my parents were. So on my way to Dallas, I came to visit Dr. Jim, and he says to me, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I'm going to pioneer chiropractic in Latin America. And he said, well, you don't really know much about Latin America, Fab. Let me help you. I had already in my mind realized that the whole South America and Central America were starving for chiropractic. And I felt like I had what it took to do it, but I really didn't. But I wanted I was already being that. So he said, how about coming working with me? He said, well, what can you offer me? He said, well, I'll make you a director of admissions and assistant to the president, and I'll pay you $1,000 a month, no benefits, work your 16-hour day, seven days a week. <laughs> that was the offer. And I said, yes. I said, as long as you allow me to be in your space. You see, being is about modeling. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Just be around. You know, Anthony Robbins and Jim Brown taught a lesson that says that we are the sum of the five people we surround ourselves with the most. You heard that before? We are the sum of the five people we surround ourselves the most. Being is about surrounding yourself with the people you want to become like. Why? Because when you're modeling, you begin to do what it is that it takes you to have the things that they have. Now, I never saw myself necessarily as someone like Dr. Jim. I never saw myself as president of the school, even though, as a student, he would always tell me I'll be president one day. I would always tell him, I'll do it when I'm 60, because the job paid $1 a year at the time. <laughs> Most of you don't know that, that Dr. Jim never got paid a salary for being president for all the years he was president. And he contributed more money to the school to this day than anyone else out there to get the school going. But you see, I was modeling him during that time, and little did I know that after he passed away, the board would ask me to serve on that capacity at a, such a young age, at a time that I was loving my practice and enjoying the success, but it wasn't what I was meant to be. I was always meant to be the thing that I was working towards, which is modeling him. And I started modeling him to the point that then I started becoming like him. And people would come to me and say, Fab, what do you think Dr. Jim will say towards this? And I was almost right on all the time because I could be like him, I could think like him. So I want you to understand something. This principle will change your life personally and professionally. I want you to, anytime that you have a thought that you wanna have something, I want you to ask yourself two simple questions. Who do I need to be to have it, right? So who do you know in your life or who do you know out there that is actually having what it is that you wanted to have? And what is it that they do on a regular basis and model that? Does that make sense? Whether it's your practice, whether it's your professional life, whether if you're a CA and you want to become the biggest CA in the world, I want you to know that the being is something that is yours, no one else's. There's been so many times. Look, I'm in my third career right now. I was a chiropractor practitioner for 10 years. Then I became a president of a college, you know, for 13 and a half years. 
and now I'm doing media and television and radio and speaking and books, a whole different career. Why? Because my being, and this is what I want to leave you with, can never be about me. It has to be about a cause bigger than myself. And when you, want, when you find what that cause is, I promise you, then you will have the being that you really were meant to have and not that your limited thinking thinks that it is. Because I want you to know that you were meant for greatness. You will never be in this profession unless you were meant for greatness. Because this profession is the profession that will actually save the health of humanity by simple removing interference and allowing the body to heal the way it was designed to heal. God bless you. Thank you so much.